everybody. It's wonderful to see a big crowd here. Um, nice to see familiar names, including many from um, the class that I'm currently teaching. So this is a nice little break from research methods. Uh, so welcome. Um, I'm Dr. E from the Chicago School from the CMHC program. Um, and I thought it might be nice just for each of us presenters who are here to just do a quick um, maybe line of introduction where we are and how we came to this topic. Um, Myself, I'm in Denver, Colorado, and I work with survivors of complex trauma, which led me to realizing that many of those survivors were also survivors of trafficking. And that led me to join our Denver Anti-Trafficking Alliance with the Denver District Attorney's Office, um, and I'm the co-chair of the Mental Health Subcommittee there. Claire, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, my name is Claire Openshaw. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor here in Chicago. Um, it wasn't actually my counseling work that got me interested in this area. It was actually my work as a flight attendant, um, but just with my interest in um, trauma, um, naturally kind of go in this area um, and then kind of just researching the area too. Mark and I am Lindsay. I am a student at the Chicago School. I got interested in this topic just um, from having Dr. E as my advisor and being, just seeing her passion for um, advocating for victims of sex trafficking. It really sparked a passion in me. And so I'm learning as much as I can while in school before being able to help people um, outside of school. And you're also a member of the, of the Denver Anti-Trafficking Alliance. Don't forget that. <laughs> um, and I'm Dr. Foster, and I um, am not in Denver or Chicago. I am in Louisiana, um, and Dr. E is my favorite person in the world to consult with around um, trafficking. I, too, see um, survivors of complex trauma in my private practice, and um, there's a... Um, a tangible link between complex trauma and trafficking. And so um, when it began to um, really kind of be prominent in my office and working with my clients, I got trained and I got information and um, now I'm a staunch advocate to, uh, I was telling Claire, Lindsay and Dr. E on Saturday, I will talk to anybody that will listen. And so, um, so I too, and kind of right where the others are in terms of really interested and passionate about the topic and what it means. Okay, thanks everyone. So here's what we have ahead of us today. Um, as you heard several of us talking about the complex trauma, um, child abuse is one of the most classic forms of complex trauma. So we're going to be looking at how how those two things are associated, uh, childhood abuse and um, heightened vulnerability for sex trafficking specifically. Um, we're gonna look at warning signs, uh, warning signs that someone may have been previously trafficked or someone that um, signs that someone might be currently trafficked, which in uh, the state of the world, unfortunately, we're likely to see, um, actually likely to see that increase right now, which is pretty disappointing. Um, and then we're also going to look at some of these elements, uh, traumatic sexualization, powerlessness, betrayal, and stigma, how those play a role in a survivor's experience with both um, childhood abuse and trafficking. So just some general info um, on human trafficking. When we talk about what it is, this definition, um, both from a, a conceptual side, but also from the legal definition, we're looking at three main elements, act, means, and purpose. Uh, so for something to be classified as trafficking clinically or um, legally, there has to be an act, and that act might include recruitment, transportation, um, holding or harboring. Um, so it doesn't always have to include that transportation piece, which is one of the um, misconceptions, so that can be part of that act. Um, and then it's done through a certain means, threat, force, coercion. Those are some of the, um, some of the top three, that threat, force, or coercion, but it can also include abduction, fraud, deceit, abuse. Um, so this is sort of the, the how it happens. 
Um, and then the purpose, the why behind this is that they are done for the purpose of exploiting that individual for the gain of the other, oftentimes money, certainly power, uh, prestige, um, and of course other benefits as well. So there's a lot of different uh, forms that trafficking can take. Um, we're talking specifically about sex trafficking today, but it's really important that we don't overlook labor trafficking um, as well. That's a very, very common form of trafficking here in the US as well as around the world that just doesn't get the, uh, the same attention. Um, it's just not as sensationalized, honestly. Um, and there's also things like organ trafficking, uh, child soldiers, um, illegal adoption, uh, domestic servitude, and individuals who are forced into uh, begging crimes and even marriage for the benefit of another. So the demand, unfortunately, is quite high. And you can imagine that these are the statistics that we know, um, kind of similar to the numbers that we're seeing on the news. Like, they're, they're misrepresented. We just don't have all the data. Um, and so these are the numbers that we can know. Um, which are still quite high from 2017, 4.8 million traffic for sex. Um, it's the third most profitable organized crime in the world. I've seen this kind of go within the top two or three um, rankings. Um, drug trafficking and arms trafficking are, are right up there with it. Um, and part of that being such a high, um, highly profitable organization is because with um, with arms and with drugs, once you sell your product, it's gone. That the, the buyer has it and they take it. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to people, that person is not gone. They can be sold over and over and over again. Um, and unfortunately, from um, the work that I've done with survivors, it's not being sold once a day. It's being sold many, many times during the day day after day. And so for the perpetrators, that is endless income, endless access to power. Um, and for the survivor, that's endless exploitation and trauma. So with sex trafficking uh, specifically, this is gonna be defined as any kind of commercial sex act that includes that forced fraud or coercion. And when the person is um, under age 18. Um, this is, it's a topic that I often talk about with some of my survivor clients um, when they've been called a child prostitute. That there's no such thing as a child prostitute. When you're under 18, it is trafficking. Um, no matter how willing, and I hope you can see my air quotes as I say this, um, the child appears to be, uh, no matter how attached or um, in love or affectionate the child appears to be with their uh, perpetrator or their John. That is always uh, trafficking when you're under 18. Um, so um, we don't always see the exchange for, um, for money specifically. It can be for things like shelter, food, uh, protection, clothing, um, access to resources, drugs, things like that. Um, and it doesn't always have to be an explicit um, sex act either. It can be pornography, um, both um, video, cyber, you know, all kinds of different forms of, of sexual exploitation. Um, and our final point down here, just that alarm is 51.6%, over half of the criminal trafficking cases in 2018 involved children. Um, not something that we really want to have to wrap our head around, uh, but the reality is that it is extremely common. Uh, one of the kind of classic books that I always go to uh, for this topic is called uh, Not in Our Backyard. And that title is just perfect um, because we often hear people say, oh yeah, that happens in another country or that happens in Las Vegas, but that doesn't happen in my town we can promise you that once you start to recognize it and once you open your eyes to it, you will see it happening in, in your town, uh, no matter where you are. <clears throat> okay, I think this goes to Dr. Foster. 
And so um, I just want to piggyback off of something you said, um, Dr. E. We sat in a group on Saturday and we shared our stories of when we first encountered or understood or knew what it meant uh, for someone to be trafficked. And again, we all come from our own perspectives or whatever else. I come from a tiny town that is a tiny dot on a map. And we, um, Dr. E and I, we send each other articles back and forth, uh, usually on Fridays, because that tends to be the only day we, we have some downtime to be able to do it. Um, but it's kind of the tapestry of trafficking in America. And um, routinely, I can just log onto my Facebook, go to um, the local um, news authority here, and I can pick up an article. And what makes us so unique is we're kind of, we kind of have two sets of interstates that run through my little bitty town. And so it would be very easy for me to just turn the blind eye and say, not in my town. Um, that, that doesn't happen here. Uh, when in reality, that absolutely is the case. And so um, it's really important that as you begin to, to bend your lens around what this actually looks like and means, we understand susceptibility to trafficking. And so um, at times, most of the time, more likely than not, there's going to be these elements of vulnerability um, that include abusive backgrounds or a strong desire to be loved. And so what I always like to tell people when we look at what it means to be susceptible, um, we need only look as far as Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Because when someone's not getting their most basic needs met, um, it really kind of puts them at risk to do things that say someone who were getting all of their needs met may not have the same challenges. And so really taking a look at, you know, the desire to be loved and sheltered and cared for. And so think about vulnerability and what that means. Again, travelers lure individuals under these false pretenses, work, shelter, love, security, safety. Um, and that's sometimes... You know, Dr. E and I have had these conversations before around why it's so difficult for people who have been trafficked to walk away from that. Um, because you're asking me to leave a place where at least I had shelter and security. Um, no, I wasn't loved and yes, I was beaten and yes, I was exploited, but I was safe. And so really like thinking about what it means again uh, to have false, false pretenses and why that makes people so susceptible. In the United States, the average age of teens um, who enter the sex trade is, is 12 to 14 years old. And many of the victims are runaway girls who are sexually abused as children. But I always like to give a statistic around, um, around this. Does anybody, and you can just pop it in the chat if you know, does anybody know the number of beds for uh, uh, teenagers who identify as males in your state? Do you know how many beds there are? For, for people who've been trafficked? I can tell you what it is in my state. It's really easy statistic, it's zero. Um, and so, you know, when you get very granular about uh, runaways and, and safe spaces and safe places and those kinds of things, it paints a really grim picture of what it looks like for someone who is 12 years old, who's been who is susceptible and has been exploited. It, it's a very grim reality for what that's going to look like um, for the duration. Um, zero in New York State too. For girls, there are plenty, but none for boys specifically. Thank you for adding that, Jessica. Um, you can advance the slide. And sorry if you guys hear my thing, my cord going off. I don't know why that is. And so, when we look at susceptibility and we look at vulnerability, child abuse goes hand in hand with that, hands down. And so when there are lots of laws, um, both federal and state, that really look at what it means for a child to be abused. And so at its most rudimentary level, child abuse occurs when a caregiver causes emotional, sexual, or physical mistreatment or, or acts with neglect to act for someone who's under the age of 18. Um, and so that's a very broad scope. So what, and we find um, certain times of the year, um, that's not to say that it doesn't exist in other times, don't mishear me, but we find that 
there are times when when trafficking peaks, right? Um, or when someone's needs are not being met. Right now, from everything I've read in the current state of the United States, um, you know, we can have your listening ears on because you're hearing more and more about it every day, um, that people don't have the means to take care of their children, child abuse cases are on the rise, sexual exploitation is on the rise, um, and so child abuse and trafficking really do go hand in hand. Research also demonstrates that a history of child abuse makes a child susceptible to further victimization. Um, sometimes the person who, who um, exploits them is also the person who they call mom or dad. And so it's really important to recognize that not only is it sometimes we think not in my backyard, we also think not in that family, right? And that's not the reality at all. Um, and so, Children with a history of abuse are at higher risk for being victimized. You can advance the slide. So let's talk about that history of abuse. In one study, 25 medical records were retroactively reviewed and patients under the age of 18 had disclosed their involvement in domestic minor sex trafficking to medical providers. Um, the majority of patients were female with an average age of being 15.4. Um, and that was between 2013 and 2015. Again, the data we have coming out on this is not always the best or the most accurate. It's what we have. Um, some reasons it may not be the most accurate or best we have. I, having treated uh, male sex male sex trafficking survivors, I would say that sometimes it's, uh, there's a lot of stigma around reporting, whether it's males or females. I would say that males are probably grossly underrepresented in the numbers that we have. Um, the data is slow to come in. And again, we don't always want to know what's in our backyard. Um, some identified psychosocial characteristics to consider. 92% disclosed alcohol and substance use um, were an issue. 88 were exposed to child maltreatment. 88 percent were exposed to child maltreatment. And so when we talk about being susceptible, 88 percent is a very large number. 60 percent had a history of running away behavior and 28 percent were placed in a group home or child protective service custody. And so it, um, some of it was Graphic are, what's the word I want to use, um, serious enough to require out-of-home placement. Um, you know, I was reading a fascinating article just in the code crisis, and um, I was talking to um, another professor here today about um, a situation where they took in a foster child. Um, and we are also in a position in the United States where group homes, foster families, all of those kinds of things, you know, those are at a premium right now. And that's not always the case that people are going to have or can be um, provided those opportunities. And so what does that mean for children who have been trafficked? Where do they go? Um, so yes, susceptibility, high rates of abuse. If you get nothing else from my presentation, um, just really understand the prevalence and what that means. You can advance the slide. I don't think this is my slide. Um, I can, um, I can, if, if, if I can do it or. Yeah, no. Um, so kind of just in connection with um, talking about child abuse and then trafficking, I mean, a statistic that we all kind of really fear is the involvement of um, family members um, and kind of something to consider is that the family members themselves may be being exploited themselves too. And so it's kind of recruitment in that way. So when you talk about how um, people are kind of trafficked in or getting involved in trafficking, um, the statistics show that family members are involved 41% of the time, um, intimate partner, maybe 14% of the time, 
a friend 11% of the time, and then other people maybe 34% of the time. And to kind of understand a little bit more about, um, you know, getting involved um, with um, the exploitation, you know, there's the stereotype that there's this um, creepy person in this white van. And so it's so much more complicated than that. And um, often it's those that are being trafficked that are asked or forced um, to go out and recruit others. So that really looks like it could be someone, you know, the same age, um, possibly the same um, gender, um, you know, similar kind of interests, really recruiting um, them. So um, the recruitment aspect really is um, an important one to kind of understand when you're looking at trafficking. Um, and then a statistic here shows that we've, we've spoken a lot about, you know, boys and, and men kind of be involved in um, trafficking. And, and this study shows that families are more likely um, to be involved in trafficking and, and boys are 61% of that. Um, and just kind of on that topic, um, you know, talking about the LGBTQ population, you know, they are at a, a really high significant rate of trafficking and, and it's something that's not spoken about either. And so even in talking about finding placement and, um, and safe housing for the LGBT, LGBTQ population, you know, that, that just adds another layer of difficulty for them to be able to find that, that safe placement. Um, and then recruitment by a family member um, or relative, um, you know, is really four times more likely in children um, than it is in adults. And so, you know, even just that process of kind of being able to, to recruit them um, and manipulate them into that life. Um, obviously children are, are way easier to, to be controlled in, in that regard. So when we, um, oh, you can go on to the next slide. So when um, we kind of talk about these concepts of um, abuse and then um, look at how that brings um, them into being vulnerable for trafficking. And um, there was a study done by Finkler um, Hoare sorry, Finkelhor and Brown. And so this, this study kind of, what they attempted to do was develop this framework for understanding the effects of child sexual abuse. So they came up with these four traumagenic dynamics. Um, so that's traumatic sexualization, powerlessness, betrayal, and then stigmatization. So these are identified as core to the psychological injury um, really inflicted by the abuse. Um, and so these dynamics kind of change um, a child's cognition and really changes their emotional orientation to the world and then to themselves. So really like how they view themselves um, and the world really changes um, after they've experienced uh, abuse. You can advance the slide. So when we look at um, the traumatic sexualization, so, so what is that? So a child's sexuality is shaped in a, in a developmentally inappropriate and interpersonally dysfunctional way. And so this is as a direct result of sexual abuse. So I think to kind of put that into context, it's really understanding that, um, you know, we're all sexual beings. So to be able to understand what's appropriate and what's not, um, and, and so to understand what sexual acts um, are, is the child engaging in and what is developmentally appropriate for that. I have a good, really good resource that I will actually um, post in the chat to, to kind of see um, what, what activities are appropriate. And so that could be an indicator of, you know, is, is, has this child been exposed um, to, to something that wasn't developmentally appropriate at that time? So in kind of um, having this, um, uh, so when a child is rewarded for sexual behavior in this kind of exchange, um, you know, the child learns that sexual behavior is what's going to get me what I need to get. And so if this is their norm, um, you know, for a trafficker, that's, a, you know, that's very easy to kind of continue that and to continue that abuse and exploitation. So for a child um, engaging in um, or being abused in this way, um, really it kind of distorts their, um, their view of their bodies and um, of sexual activity. So when you're looking at the traumatization, um, 
and the traumatic sexualization, you're really kind of looking at, um, the, at, at um, the degree to which someone may experience that. So this would vary, um, and it really depends on um, how that child um, was maybe manipulated in those ways or whether force was used. So there's a lot of aspects that kind of um, contribute to what degree um, that individual uh, faces the traumatic sexualization. You can go on to the next slide. So the powerlessness, this is really central to the, the whole trafficking experience. Um, so in, in this context, it's when a child's will is violated um, or their body is invaded and abused. And so they talk about this feeling of um, being powerless and, uh, and, you know, with repeated abuse, um, you know, this is going to develop much more. And this is ideal for traffickers. Traffickers will prey on that. Um, you know, they will gain their control of victims. And if um, that person is already feeling powerless, um, you know, it, it's much easier to be able to kind of exploit them. Um, and then being in that situation where there's harm that's being threatened. Um, and this is just going to really exacerbate that feeling of being powerless. So, you know, during um, the, ch during the ch uh, childhood ages when um, this could be reinforced by a child disclosing this and nothing being done or not being um, believed or being blamed for the situation. Um, and so their inability to kind of stop um, the abuse is going to really um, contribute to that feeling of powerless. Um, you know, and these feelings of powerlessness is going to cause anxiety, um, but it also really impairs um, the inability to um, to cope, to be able to feel like they are able to cope in these situations. So that's where a lot of the impairment comes from. Now uh, you can go on to the next slide. So betrayal, and even just kind of, you know, in the context of um, family involvement, um, you know, so occurs when a betrayal occurs when a child becomes aware um, whom they that they were betrayed by someone whom that caused them harm. So due to the molestation um, or the realization of molestation, because depending on the age at which they were abused, um, then the understanding around that may look different. Um, and the betrayal may come from individuals in their lives um, that weren't necessarily part of the abuse but perhaps were um, unable to or unwilling to help them in that situation. And we really talk about unable because um, it could be a situation where those family members or those people in that person's lives were themselves abused or are in the abusive situation too. And they may be unable to help um, for various reasons. And then we talk about um, the aspect of not being believed. Um, in all my work with sexual assault, assault survivors, you know, the, the first thing we, we learn in training is, is really reinforcing and saying like, I believe you, because that could be the first time that that person has heard that someone believes them. Um, so again, kind of traffickers prey on this betrayal um, and they, they lure them in by this, this promise of love and safety and security and you know, for many who have endured that feeling of betrayal, there's this hope for this redeeming relationship that I'm going to find that person that is going to love and care for me. And so traffickers really prey on that. Um, and then the next slide. So this is the, this is the last aspect um, that Finkler and Brown talk about, and it refers to stigmatization. So really stigmas, those negative views associated with the child's experiences. So um, these views, these negative views are really kind of relayed through to the child. And this is going to incorporate in their own image of, of who they are. And so those feelings of shame and guilt um, really kind of become ingrained. Um, and often when they are abused, often when they're blamed for the abuse um, and, and even talking about the secrecy of, you know, around abuse and this may look different in, in different cultures. So I think that that's an important aspect to kind of um, remind ourselves when we're engaging in this work too. Um, but, you know, stigma is, 
is ultimately ostracizing and, um, you know, and can isolate people. And isolation is key for, you know, traffickers um, are known to kind of, you know, go towards those that are isolated, even in regards to runaways um, who are vulnerable and alone. And there's various statistics, but some statistics show that runaways are picked up by traffickers between 24 and 48 hours. So it's these kind of aspects um, of, of abuse that really kind of um, make those children uh, vulnerable to trafficking. So I'm gonna pass it on to Lindsay, who's gonna talk about warning signs. Yes, so there are quite a few different warning signs to look out for, um, which may indicate that someone is a victim of human trafficking. Um, so we're gonna start with physical. Um, some of the physical signs are tattoos, uh, potentially displaying the name or maybe a nickname of a trafficker like daddy, uh, bruises or other signs of physical trauma, hunger, malnourishment, um, inappropriate dress based on weather conditions or surroundings, uh, signs of a drug addiction, and sudden change in attention to personal hygiene. Uh, moving on to the emotional um, warning signs. So maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend of the victim who's just noticeably older or very controlling over that, um, over the other person. Uh, withdrawn behavior, depression, anxiety, or fear. Um, Hyper arousal symptoms such as anger, panic, phobia, frequent quiet, crying and temper tantrums, um, or even regressive behavior or clinging behavior. Um, and some hypo arousal symptoms such as daydreaming, inability to bond with others, um, inattention, forgetfulness, or even um, shyness. And with some behavioral warning signs, there's sudden change in attire or behavior, relationships, or material possessions, like suddenly owning very expensive items. Um, potentially an inability to attend school on a regular basis or um, someone with a lot of unexcused absences frequent running away from home behavior, um, uncharacteristic promiscuity or references to sexual situations or terminology that is beyond their age specific norms. Um, they may be attempting to conceal scars or tattoos or bruises. Um, they may not be in control of their money or have a large debt and don't really have a way to pay it off. Uh, they could when answering questions can have coerced or rehearsed responses to questions. Uh, they may make references to frequent travel to other cities um, and a lack of control over their personal schedule or maybe even their identification documents like a passport or green card. And we provided some national resources um, that might be useful to you. Uh, ranging from just the, NAF, the human trafficking hotline or the suicide hotline and a few other things as well. Yeah, and just kind of even going off the warning signs, I mean, kind of even looking in all of those areas, you know, really um, <laughs> traffickers are getting really savvy. And so, you know, it, it, it isn't that aspect, like I mentioned earlier, about, you know, someone being kidnapped and you know taken away it's they could be dropping that child off at school and then picking them up afterwards and and so I think it's about really trying to kind of notice you know and those signs um really can kind of be subtle but if you know what you're looking for and so that's kind of ultimately I suppose the goal of kind of recognizing some of these signs of you know while maybe that child is coming into school looking really tired maybe they all of a sudden have you know have um their nails done and makeup on and things like that that may be a little bit more um out of character or or, or completely different to what they were doing and so you know for teachers and school counselors and um you know people that are kind of engaging in that way it's to kind of you know really recognize those signs um, as subtle as they can be. And I know that somebody in the um, chat box um, had said that they came across a man who would go into the woman's jail to recruit. And so, yeah, that's, you know, the recruitment strategies, 
even even bond you know when they're paying out their bonds and things like that um you know there's places that you're able to kind of see who's be who's being released and so um waiting outside the jails to be able to kind of be there be there to support that person as they've just come out of jail may not have any work may have debts to be paid and things like that and so yeah that they're in a vulnerable situation the criminal justice system um really is one of the places that you know counselors and um lots of social service you know engage in and so it's so important for you know social services to be able to kind of identify these um identify those that are being exploited in, in these kind of ways um, and we could all kind of play a, a part in in that. Claire, I want to piggyback on what you're saying there because when we look at these different you know warning signs we can see how they might be easier or more difficult to see depending on the setting in which we're working. So for example, I as a counselor who doesn't work in a school might not know if my client was having lots of absences, but the teacher might. And so what we're seeing is a really, um, a really big push amongst communities to create this multidisciplinary um, effort so that the teachers are talking to the nurses who are talking to the counselors, who are talking to the physicians, who are talking to parental roles who are talking to, you know, and extending that community members, neighbors, the more we as counselors can educate and advocate, even outside of our clinical offices, the more we're going to make a dent in this and ultimately have fewer, hopefully, uh, clients that they come to us having been terrorized and traumatized by this, but we can't, um, we can't look at this as just a counselor's responsibility to detect, find, and then treat uh, all the victims and survivors. It has to be a community-wide effort. Yeah, and I, I mean, I recently went to a conference where they discussed a study that was done. It was done in England, and um, they found that the 10 children that they had conducted the, this, um, these interviews with it was the police that actually identified these as having been trafficked where the counselors and the social services were saying, well, no, that that's not really trafficking. Mm -hmm. And that surprised me. And so it makes me <laughs> want to do my work, you know, even more, but um, mm -hmm. you know, it's so important for even those different collaborations of people to be coming together and saying, this is why this is trafficking and even what trafficking is, because um, so many mm -hmm. people think that that transportation needs to happen, whereas really that's not, that's not what, what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, and I just want to piggyback off of what you both said from a child abuse perspective. Sometimes we grossly mislabel what has happened um, to children. And I want to go back to what Dr. E said in the beginning, um, you know, around what is trafficking and what is not. And so also I think just in general, communities are not comfortable with the language that surrounds trafficking. And so anytime you're educated um, to be able to have a conversation with someone else to start to dispel the myths that surround what is trafficking and what is not is really important. And, you know, in my community, one of the places when COVID lets up that I will go do a workshop is actually at a church. Um, because again, you know, the, the minister from that church reached out to me and said, I don't know what I don't know. And I was like, not a problem. Let me come help educate you with the knowledge that this is only the beginning of the sentence. This is not all the information that you're going to need. Communities have wonderful resources. I know in my area, I'm part of the uh, Greater New Orleans um, trafficking task force. They routinely put on um, uh, workshops. I just recently over the summer went to a two-day training that they put on and sitting next to me was a survivor's parent and on the other side was a sitting judge. And so it really is a community effort in terms of really understanding, educating, and demystifying the entire topic. And I think when we talk about um, the resources, um, the import, um, the national um, hotline number for trafficking, um, you know, 
to be able to get statistics on those that are being trafficked is really, really hard. And it's really due to kind of this insidious nature of the whole trafficking aspect. But, you know, the Human Trafficking National Hotline, um, that number there, they really capture that data. So if you, if you, if you do become aware of anything, um, you know, calling that number will allow them to kind of get a better idea of, you know, maybe this is happening in different areas more so or things like that. So it's really kind of informing um, them because to be able to try and get information um, is, is difficult. So, you know, even if anyone becomes aware of it to kind of report it to the national um, trafficking hotline so that they'll be able to kind of capture that data, um, which is really important. Mm -hmm. And the hotlines, you know, these are our national hotlines, but I would guess that uh, most of us have even a local hotline, um, including our child abuse hotline. You know, so when we're looking at this intersection between the two, you don't have to have 100% proof. You, you don't have to be the investigator. If you see enough warning signs, just call. It, it never hurts to call. Um, and, you know, there are the folks who are trained to do the investigations who can follow up that call. Um, you know, as everybody's been talking, I've just been reflecting on, um, you know, what this, what this looks like for clients in our treatment plans. And, you know, when we're working through the different aspects that come up during counseling. And, you know, what I was thinking is, I came across trafficking accidentally, like I said, I was working with, with survivors and it had never dawned on me. Um, that there would, someone who had abuse would also likely be trafficked. And I think we need to think of that also in reverse, is that when we're working with survivors of trafficking, don't just focus on the trafficking itself, because it's very likely that before they were even in that trafficking life, they experienced, um, you know, lots of heartbreak, abuse, exploitation already. And like when Claire was walking through those four elements, when those are your foundation around who you are, your sexual identity, your identity and relationships with others who are supposed to be safe and caring, those are all going to come into that office with you. And those are all going to be dynamics that um, are pervasive throughout the treatment. So not just what is the topic that we're talking about today, what is the dynamic between us, um, I can never expect a client to trust me. Why would I expect them to trust me when every safe person or caring person in their life has somehow betrayed them or exploited them? So, so knowing those dynamics and understanding that they're going to weave, um, they're going to weave themselves in just like a tapestry of the counseling that you're doing, I think is an important part of understanding what this is going to look like um, in the counseling realm. Dr. E, I want to touch on something you said around calling your local Department of Children and Family Services. That was part of this last training I went to, and it, I have to tell you, as much as I've done around this, that was something that was never, it never struck me to do until that, that um, training. And what they said with, what it really resonated with me. They said, you know, the way the law is written, you only need to have a cause to believe that there's a concern. You don't have to have a smoking gun. You don't need to have proof. You only need to have a cause to believe. And, you know, I thought about it and I thought about kind of my intersection into the world of working with this. And yeah, that, you know, it, it, there's a lot of pressure taken off when you don't have to be the investigator, when you don't have to gather the evidence, you don't have to gather the proof. I would challenge that lots of times that that wastes precious time. And so really just being willing to take the cause to believe, if you have a cause to believe there's concern and reporting that to the appropriate authorities. You know, the other thing that I find sometimes with um, the work around doing counseling with uh, survivors of trafficking is it can be very isolating and demanding work. And so really kind of understanding and balancing our role and staying in our lane with the work we do and recognizing that it is not our job to investigate. And if we do investigate, we may really screw something up for our client. 
Um, you know, so really recognizing the differences between doing the work with your client and doing someone else's work for your clients. Um, and that really resonated with me in that last training that I went to. And I hope that, you know, it, it's resonated with someone on the call today. And I'm seeing that there are some chats coming in, but every time I go to the chat, I lose the slides. So I'm going <laughs> to let somebody else look at the chat to see if there are any questions so far, comments. So there was um, a question that from someone saying that they live, you know, in an impoverished rural community and there's very little resources. Um, and, and so they would like to be able to help, but kind of given that situation. Um, so they were asking for any ideas. I would look for your nearest task force. You know, in my local community, we don't have a task force all of our own. And so the closest one for me in my community is the New Orleans task force. Um, and so the other thing that they do, um, you know, is they also provide resources. Um, they can tell you who to contact in your local area. Uh, your state government is probably going to have some sort of listing of the, the chapters, hotlines, resources, task force in your area. Um, so use your local government and use the task force that's closest to you or one you can find because they can be a wealth of information. I, that's exactly what I was going to say, Dr. Foster, that, you know, I know here in Denver, of course, we're a big city and we've got our task force, but what we're working on is creating trainings that we can then kind of satellite out to any rural um, areas in the in the whole state of Colorado and even in our um, our little subcommittee you know Lindsay's in Colorado Springs that's an hour away that's not Denver we've got people you know two hours to the north people want to fill the need they want to help support others so if you just put that question put that request out there to maybe a larger um, city or, or a task force like Dr. Foster said that's nearby, I bet that they would love to connect you or send resources or send trainings um, and bring you into that network with them. Yeah, just recently the training that I went to in, in at the end of last year was a train the trainer. And so the whole purpose of that was for us to be able to take the things that we're doing to bring back to our communities and begin to build that network. And, you know, it's and the network, like I said, and like Dr. E said, it can be anybody. It can be any advocate um, who want to sustain the effort of eliminating trafficking in their area. And so, um, you know, when I say bend your perspective around this, it really, the optics are think outside of counseling alone, think outside of mental health alone, think about who are your advocates in the fight. And I think that there's a lot of, you know, a lot of these nonprofits um, need help maybe in different ways. So maybe if you have skills in, I don't know, marketing or websites or things like that, there may be ways to be able to help um, them um, and they, and, you know, kind of fill those gaps. Um, yeah. Uh, there is another question and um, Holly's saying, I'm curious about the 18 plus age group. There must be so many people in that group as well, and they are not being accounted for or reported. Um, is it assumed that once they're 18, they are consensual or able to leave? No. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> you can see Dr. Foster. Like, no, no, no. I'm going to let you take that, Dr. E. You can... <laughs> I felt like I was hogging all the questions. Um, yeah, actually, all, all of the clients um, that I work with are all older than 18. Um, and absolutely, they are still survivors of trafficking. That, that force, fraud, and coercion um, still exists even when you're not considered a legal minor, um, whether, whether it's the attachment that is there and threatening to take that away um, to I've got video of you and I've, I know what you did, even though what you did is what they were forced or coerced to do, um, the power of that being used against um, these individuals is just extremely difficult to get away from. And even I was talking with a, a survivor this week and really talking about COVID, 
And she was sharing her deep sadness that in times like this, people um, are going to be more likely to even get reconnected or pulled back into the trafficking life because they might feel like they have no other option. If there's no other way to find work, if there's no other way to keep the roof above their head, if there's no other person out there in the world who seems to give a damn about them, part of my language, um, that's, that's the pull of, of the trafficker. That's the pull of this uh, really complicated uh, dynamic. So absolutely, adults are trafficked. Absolutely. You know, when you talk about the pull, um, and I have my former client's permission to say this, um, she was not only, I mean, her pimp, um, her John, you know, because she says, you know, she was willing after the age of 18, I'm using your air quotes, Dr. E, um, you know, she, he got her pregnant and then took her child from her and she had to fight tooth and nail mm -hmm. up against a judicial system that didn't understand what trafficking was. You know, the judge said, you know, I don't really know much about prostitution. Um, and, you know, it just made my head spin because she was absolutely trafficked and she is a survivor of trafficking and she wages the war every day. She has a child with, you know, her perpetrator. Um, and, that's going to be her reality for as long as she lives, right? And so she was 23 when she had a baby. And so she was absolutely trafficked. It absolutely continues to be her story. And it absolutely continues to affect her. Mm -hmm. I know we'll probably be finishing up soon. Um, you know, in other, in other ways to kind of help <laughs> for for me, I believe that like research and information is so important and trying to be able to um, provide accurate kind of data so that that will be able to inform so much more. Um, I'm conducting research at the moment <laughs> um, and it's really looking at the efficacy and um, how effective is a sex trafficking webinar and so if there's any counselors who want to try and contribute in this way um, I I can post the um, link for the study um, it'll be wrapping up um, in a few days so um, if anybody's interested in kind of um, contributing in that way um, but also um, to be able to go out and do your own research because it's so important for us to be able to kind of really be informed um, about the whole epidemic. And, and just as we've been saying throughout this presentation it's so hard to get uh, solid statistics in the on this population so if you do have you know, an extra, what does it look like? An hour, an extra hour in your day, today, tomorrow. Um, what a great way to, to contribute to this field right now and know that you're making a difference by, uh, by helping Claire with her research and ultimately helping all of us and all of our clients. Okay, any other questions in the chat before we run out of time? I don't see any more here. Unless I've missed any. But. I did also po uh, post the resource for um, the um, kind of age appropriate sexual behavior. Um, and it's just a guideline, of course, um, but that's in the chat box too. Wonderful. Thanks, Claire. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, then thank you all so much for being here and for participating and especially for your interest in this topic. And um, I hope I can speak for all of us when I say you're welcome to reach out to any of us uh, if you want to get involved or talk more about this topic. Even if it's just help me find resources in my area, um, we would be more mm -hmm. than happy to spend you know, however long it takes to help you find resources in your area to contribute to the cause. Absolutely.
Okay, thank you all so much. We will give some space